Hello there and welcome to Science Epics 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series that recounts the history of the human presence in outer space from the launch of Sputnik in October 4th, 1957 to the present day. It's the 60 year anniversary of human beings going to outer space beginning in October of 1957. It's now 2017. I am your hostess with the mostest on this flight across time and space as we retell the adventures of humankind taking its first steps out into the cosmos and the great beyond. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epics 60 Years of the Space Age. Right, so, I've got a great story for y'all today, as we begin part 7 of our retelling. We've reached a very important moment here on 60 years of the space age. Not just because it's part 7 now on the show, and 7 is largely considered all over the world to be a lucky and mystical number. I'm thinking about 7 wonders of the world, 7 deadly sins, and 7 layers of heaven like that. Not that I would typically buy into any of that letter nonsense, but hey, even six is afraid of seven, because seven, eight, nine, right? <laughs> but I digress. It's a very special and momentous event that we are approaching now on the show that we're going to talk about today. And this event and what it coincides with this year in 2017 is part of the reason why I started 60 years of the space age to begin with, to commemorate what I believe is the greatest age of human history, the space age that was started with the launch of the man-made satellite Sputnik on October 4th, 1957. That would be today if you're watching this on release day, commemorating to the day officially of 60 years of the space age. Wow. So what really happened 60 years ago? Why was the launch of Sputnik such an important event? Now I'm used to saying on this podcast that the world would change forever after the fellow traveler Sputnik was launched in October 1957. But how so? How were we forever changed by Sputnik? I mean, if you look at it, our little Sputnik that flew out into space 60 years ago to become the first man-made object out there, it was a very rudimental and basic machine compared to what we have today. The object, Sputnik, weighed about 83 kilos. That's 20 kilos more than the average person and thousands of kilograms less than what we can send up into space today. Our modern day rockets like the European Ariane 6 and SpaceX Falcon 9 are capable of launching payloads of thousands of kilograms worth of communication satellite. Uh, Bori! scientific equipment and occasionally people up into space but of course the fundamental working principles of the rockets themselves a result of the designs of sergey pavlovich korolev and Werner von braun haven't changed much after all these years we still use the same concepts introduced 60 years ago to get into space and sputnik was the first thing ever that human beings would send into space Sputnik, of which the name translates into fellow traveler, was small and spherical in shape, about the size of a beach ball with four external radio antennas that were used to send some simple beeps and boops signals back down to Earth as confirmation that it had indeed achieved its mission. If you listen, actually, to the intro soundbite that we play here on 60 Years of the Space Age, before every show. That's the actual radio signal that Sputnik transmitted back down to Earth when it was in space 60 years ago. A little piece of history for you here on the show. So let me play it again so you can have a listen. That signal was first heard on Earth 60 years ago, and you're hearing it now 60 years later. Sputnik was launched as truly the first of its kind on the fourth day of October 1957, taking off at 7.30 p.m. UTC, Universal Coordinated Time. It was about 10.30 p.m. in Moscow, but at the launch site in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. It was actually the 5th of October, sometime around midnight. 
So the sky was very much pitch black at the location of the Soviet launch site. The launch site was simply named Site Number One or Ploshetka No Adin, something like that. Not really an exciting and glorious name for the place that would propel the endeavors of your people into the history books. Site Number One doesn't really have a ring to it, does it? But later on, with the flight of Yuri Gagarin, the first human to space, they would change the name of the place to Gagarin Start or Gagarinsky Start. Much better. But that visitor would only travel years later. On the night of the 4th of October, 1957, the R-7 Semyorka rocket carrying Sputnik to the stars fired its engines to life, carrying its payload up into low Earth orbit, flying fast and hard in order to reach an altitude of 200 kilometers above sea level. That would be the height mark that would define the moment of history being made. The flight path was calculated by a man named Georgi Greco from the USSR Academy of Sciences. It did not take very long for the rocket to get into space. To go from liftoff to payload delivery, that's the part where Sputnik would separate from the main rocket and enter into an orbit. You can think of an orbit in this case as making trips around the Earth. To go from liftoff to payload delivery usually takes less time than the length of a single episode of the Big Bang Theory. Rocket launches to space don't take very long because the vehicle needs to produce an explosive reaction that results in as much thrust as possible within a short amount of time as possible in order to break the chains of Earth's gravity. And a rocket has to control this incredible thrust in such a way that it doesn't explode or crash. And that's the gist of it. You can watch these videos on YouTube by the European Space Agency that track the tra trajectory of their rockets as they go from ground to orbit. And I have one myself talking about the Ariane 6 video link in the description. You guys should go check it out. I, have a, I don't have as flashy a graphical interface as the European Space Agency or an actual rocket for that matter, but I do give it a good shot. A rocket launch from Earth to orbit would typically take less than 10 minutes tops to complete. And during that time, the rocket has to go through a lot. And so many things could go wrong within that time span. Similar to the rockets of today, the journey to space for the R-7 Semyorka carrying Sputnik to the stars would involve a miraculous transformation on its way up. The R-7 Semyorka had multiple stages that it went through before it was able to deliver Sputnik to the final frontier. And that's because the R-7 rocket carrying Sputnik was something called a multi-stage rocket. It was not a single rocket, but actually many rockets combined into one, with all the attached rocket parts dropping away once their fuel has been spent during the ascent to escape Earth. Getting Sputnik to the stars in October 1957 required one of these multi-stage rockets to fly upwards and away from Earth harder, better, faster, and stronger than ever before. The R-7 Semyorka carrying Sputnik to the stars took less than 10 minutes to go from its launch station at Site 1 to the great depths of outer space. The point of demarcation, the boundary that was aimed for, it was an altitude of 200 kilometers above sea level, as mentioned earlier. That would be the definition of being in space. So imagine the distance between Munich and Stuttgart, except straight up into the sky. That's the distance that was traveled 60 years ago, but it was only the beginning. Spaceships like the R-7 really make for a wonderful spectacle when they take off through their multi-stage transformation on their way to space. If you can connect with people who have ever been fortunate enough to see a live rocket launch, you can understand the ecstatic feeling they get as they watch the rocket go up. Almost regarded like a miracle, 
unfolding before their eyes, and during the ascent of Sputnik to the stars, the select few people in attendance, the Russians, that were watching this sort of technological miracle happen for the very first time ever, and they knew that they were to be the first people in the history of peoples in this new age called the Space Age to bear witness to an instance of anything like it that night in the desolate darkness of the Kazakh countryside. You have to understand that this historical flight was actually conducted in near secrecy. It would have been dark for miles around the area, save for the lights on the launch pad and the base. So you could imagine the power and vibrations felt on that October night, with emotions that would have been mixed with feelings of anticipation as the rocket climbed higher and higher, entering the realm of what was truly unknown at the time. When the Semyorka reached a certain height, its multi-stage strap-on boosters disengaged, and this happened about two minutes into the flight after takeoff. For Russian R-series rockets that, has, that uses four powerful strap-on boosters to give it extra lift, the separation of the boosters would give rise to a phenomenon called the Korolev Cross that is visible when the four boosters detach from the main rocket. The boosters, now to borrow a quote from Tom Petty, free fallen back down to earth, would pitch over at the same time and form a sort of X or cross shape in the sky. This effect would be dubbed after the chief designer of the rocket, the Sergei Korolev, the Korolev cross. In the pitch dark of night on October 4th in the morning of the 5th, 1957, the effect was invisible to the people on the ground. But on days where the R7s and their derivatives, a modern example being the Soyuz in launch today, on clear skies you can actually see this incredible shimmering cross shape forming when the boosters separate. It really is quite magnificent to watch, a testament to what I said early on, like a miracle unfolding before your eyes. Five minutes into the flight, the main rocket shut down and Sputnik was deployed into its orbit at an altitude of more than 220 kilometers above sea level, and it began transmitting its beeps and boops. Back down to Earth. It would be picked up first by a certain Red Army junior engineer lieutenant, VG Borisov, before shooting off well below the horizon on its first orbit. Sputnik traveled at a speed of 29,000 kilometers per hour, taking 90 minutes to form one complete round trip around the Earth. The fellow traveler was actually visible from the ground with binoculars at sunrise and sunset hours, appearing as a little glint emerging over the horizon. The first artificial man-made satellite ever to be seen. Its radio transmissions were heard by amateur radio operators all over the world. After the first orbit later into that night, Sergei Korolev called Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev to inform him of the successful launch and the victory for the Soviet people. Or was it all that successful? Post-flight data showed that one of the boosters didn't achieve full power, causing a slight trajectory deviation of the rocket. Luckily, full power was achieved nearly one second right before the angle of deviation would have become too great that an automatic shutdown would have been triggered. Whew, close call. And this would have resulted in the rocket crashing back down to Earth. Whew, close call, but that was not the least of the concerns. A fuel regulator on the R7 failed 16 seconds into launch, causing excessive propellant consumption. The booster was eating propellant on overtime, causing 4% thrust above normal. This caused the rocket to cut off one second before the intended mark, with extra propellant still in the tank. Luckily, it was all within acceptable parameters. Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained, I suppose. The near failure was worth the risk as Sputnik successfully flew a total of 1,440 trips around the Earth, transmitting its beeps and boops. For 21 days before the onboard radio transmitter ran out of power, 
Despite the monumental success of its launch, Sputnik was actually destined to die to begin with. It was an unguided chunk of metal in space and several months later, in early January 1958, it fell back down to earth somewhere in the middle of the street in Manteowoc, Wisconsin, the United States of America. Huh. Which brings us to the main overreaching effects of the significance of Sputnik. Our little traveler was actually, in reality, the hollowed out casing of a nuclear warhead with a radio transmitter put in place of where the boom boom should have been. And that's what you have to soberingly realize with this moment in time and history. There were people on the ground that witnessed the launch on the 4th of October 1957. And most of them, like Sergei Korolev, the designer of the R-7 rocket, were Soviet scientists and engineers that had hectically worked around the clock to get the spacecraft ready and actually make the moment possible. But also among the group of people present were military men, Soviet Red Army men and men in uniform. These were the people that had given the sanction and the necessary funding to allow Sputnik to journey to outer space and to begin with. And Sputnik, as the herald of the space age, the first thing, the first object human beings would ever put into space, was actually intended as a demonstration of technological and military might. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for at the beginning of the space age, there was only Cold War. Props if you get that reference. <laughs> the launch of Sputnik to the stars was all a big show, like Japanese kabuki theater. It was an elaborate demonstration, the goal of which was for the benefit of the image of the military power of the Soviet Union, and perhaps some benefit for science. Maybe a little, maybe a lot, who knows. The aim was to demonstrate to a post-World War II world that leadership in the fields of science and technology would be the defining factors that would determine the global balance of power, and that the Soviet Union was clearly ahead in that contest. And because of that demonstration, people in America and the West freaked out. They lost their marbles, yo, completely. Sputnik caused a panic and crisis that would manifest itself in an orgy of technological dreams and progress called the space race. Well, that's a tale reserved for next time, here on 60 Years of the Space Age. If you enjoyed the content that we have here on Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age, be sure to help us out by dropping a donation on our Patreon through the link down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.